Hey, good morning, and welcome to the Comic Experience Graphic Novel of the Month Club, Kids Edition, the best edition. I love the Kids Club. Uh, and we've got a really, really fantastic book for you. You know, I, I love all the books that we pick. Uh, I honestly do. But um, I, I really, 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 really liked Unicorn Boy. Uh, uh, and we're super lucky to have its author, Dave Roman, right here. Hello, Dave. How are Hello. you, sir? How's it going? Thanks for that. Going really, really well. Yeah, no, I um, I really, I you know what I liked about this book was the the madness and the zaniness of it. That that like page to page, bizarre, improbable things that could only happen in comics happen. You know, and tonal shifts, you know, left and right, and you don't know what you're gonna get going forward. And and again, I say I really feel like comics are, are one of the rare mediums that, that can make it work in that particular way. That's so awesome. Thanks, man. I mean, that I mean from someone who actually knows comic, I mean, like you've interviewed like a million people on the show and you've probably had to read a billion comics over the years. So that that's that yeah. means a lot. That's wild. It's it, it made me think of a Grant Morrison comic for children. Oh, whoa. That's, that's, yeah. that's good. Cause you know, a million crazy ideas and you know, yeah. 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 And that's, it's so surreal because like when you're working on that stuff, like you just don't know what's going to hit and what's going to connect. And like, you know, like you're keeping track of it and you're, it's like, it makes sense to me, but will it make sense to anybody else? I don't know. Sure. So when I hear people actually connecting with it, it's still a little like, Really? Okay. You're yeah. as weird as I am. <laughs> yeah. Well, so this brings me neatly to, to the official first question, uh, which is always, why comics? Of all of the things you could be doing, uh, what is it about comics that speaks to you, that touches you, that makes you want to do it? It makes you especially want to chain yourself to, to a drawing table for eight hours a day and you know then spend six or eight months slaving away on something that you don't know how people are going to react to it until it actually comes out why why <laughs> why are you doing this to yourself <laughs> yeah how long do you have uh this is, <laughs> we've got as long as you want my friend uh, yeah do you have the therapist couch can i lay down while uh -huh. i talk about this uh -huh. um yeah i mean honestly everything like i you know i'm You've like so many other people on this show probably have told you like, you know, you, you get that, we, you know, we walk into that comic shop and our mind is blown. And I always say it was like, you know, going into Willy Wonka's chocolate factory and just being like, you know, a world of pure imagination, like everything on the shelf. And um, like I got a few comics when I was a little kid, like someone gave me an Uncle Scrooge comic. And I think I had like a care, like a Ewoks comic or something from Star Comics that I, you know, probably just colored over when I was little but uh, a friend of mine took me to a comic book store and I just saw things that I just couldn't believe. Like I was just, my mind was just destroyed. And I, then, and the visual that always stands out to me specifically. So this was in 1987. There was the very first um, GI Joe and the Transformers miniseries. Yeah. And it was like, a, it was, so it was a crossover, but, specifically on the cover you had gi joe the good guys firing a can a, a tank at bumblebee the nicest of the transformers and he's just being blown up you know and in my mind like i was like you couldn't do that on tv like like there was sure. like, tv at the time in the 80s was very good is good bad is bad every episode ends with a, like a very cute joke or you know quick resolution and right from that image, and then when I was like, I just have to look at what is, it just showed me immediately that comics could do anything, and that 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 you there was something cooler about it. There's something edgier about it. Um, and then I was introduced to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics, and I bought two different issues, and one of them was drawn by an artist named Eric Talbot, who has this really dark, edgy vibe to his art, and then another one was drawn by this cartoonist Mark Martin. Yeah, like this really whimsical, cartoony vibe to his stuff, and the fact that this was part of the same series, again, like that, it told me everything I needed to know about comics. That yeah. there was this celebration of individual voices and artists that can do whatever they want to do and have fun. And um, 
I just, I think I just, that infectious quality just rubbed off on me that I was like, I just need to participate in this in some way um, as a reader and as so many people, you know, like it's the, the, the logical jump from holding a comic book in your hand and realizing like, this is paper and staples. I think I could deconstruct this and make one of these. Um, and you, and you had already, well, how old were you when, when this happened? when you went to the comic oh, I'm so bad at remember I know this is this is 19 this is like around 87 uh because I remember there was like the slow build to uh Batman fever which yeah. happened in 1989 yep so I was probably like 10 years old or something like yeah, that yeah, yeah. And like you know so like I was an active reader now I could actually digest the story so like like I said I had some comics as a kid but I I don't know if I was really reading them Sure. And then it was like by 1989, comics were just everywhere. And and I lived on a street where I think three comic shops opened in a year. Um, and all of them kind of walkable to, you know, from my house, one across the street from my school. Uh -huh. um, so I don't see how I could have, you know, not been into comics, but yeah. uh, so like, I always think there was like, there's this little quiet period and then there was an explosion and everybody was into comics. And I was the kind of kid who was like, pushing it on other people the way that someone you know someone pushed comics on me and i was pushing it on other people my sister my cousins um and specifically trying to get everybody to draw comics too yeah because to me that was like the fun as well as that like we can make our own stories and entertain each other with these you know silly drawings and did you did you become a superhero kid at that point or or were you into the more independent i was into everything yeah. um i I feel like I was perhaps less into superheroes, but only because my sister was hardcore. Um, this was like during the Chris Claremont X-Men era. And my sister was reading X-Men, X-Factor, eventually X-Force. Yeah. Um, you know, there was New Mutants. You know, there was all those crossovers happening. And I couldn't keep up with all of that. Um, so I would buy, like, I remember when Acts of Vengeance came out, which was like this big crossover series, I would buy all the individual issues of that. And so I got that little taste of like all the different heroes. Yeah. Um, I became hardcore into Batman and Spider-Man. Like I definitely was like really big into them. I love the X-Men, but it was a little bit more through absorbing it through my sister, who is uh, three years younger than me, but got really into kind of like the soap opera quality of it. Um, and then for me, the stuff that I think, I became obsessed with was uh, Sergio Aragones, uh, specifically a comic shop. I went to a comic shop where they knew I love Calvin and Hobbes and the retailer was really smart and said, well, if you like that, I think you're going to like uh, Gru the Wanderer. Uh, he gave me some Disney comics. Um, and then eventually somehow I got to Milk and Cheese by Evan Dorkin. And I don't know, I don't think that was the same day, but it, very shortly after I got to milk and cheese, which was obviously like way edgier yeah. and, and more violent and, and stuff. But um, yeah, I just love like everything slave labor graphics was putting out. Um, and yeah, like, so the black and white stuff, you know, spoke to me, especially because it was very accessible as an artist to like look at the artwork and learn from the artwork. Um, and it just became clear that like you could make these, um, especially like when I learned about, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird and yeah. um, all that stuff that was happening. And then obviously image comics was happening at that time too. And um, you know, the, the power of seeing Rob Liefeld on a TV commercial, you know, selling jeans Yeah, and uh, the Stan Lee was putting out those, um, those VHS tapes where it was right. like, learn how to be a cartoonist from Todd McFarlane yeah. and uh, you know, all the image comics guys, so, like that stuff it just was all just like flooding into me. So I wasn't yet sure what type of comics I wanted to make. And I probably wanted to honestly dabble in all of it. Um, and that was part of having friends who were also comic fans and artists. It allowed me to kind of like team up with them. And like, so like, that's where I met John Patrick green um, and my friend, Rich Zimmer. And we all went to school of visual arts together. And we were right. all like excited about comics and going to comic book conventions. And I actually tabled at my first comic book convention when I was in high school. Nice. 
Nice. When you went to SVA, was there already a dedicated comics program or is it just part of the regular curriculum? Yeah, I specifically went to School of Visual Arts because they had a comics program. Uh, okay. My knowledge at the time, this is in the 90s, uh, there was School of Visual Arts. Maybe Savannah had a comics program to some right. degree, but the other big one was Joe Kubert School, Kubert um, School yeah. which wasn't a four-year accredited school. So if I had convinced my parents to go there, uh, you know, I wouldn't have gotten like the traditional comics. I mean, um, Bachelor of Fine Arts diploma. Right. So School of Visual Arts was kind of like the the balance where it's like I could do comics, but I'll also get like a traditional art degree. Um, it, you know, I think like to me the Cub the Cuban school felt more like a trade school. Yeah. Um, and it's funny now because I've spent my entire life doing comics, but I think when I was in high school there was at least the, you had to kind of maintain the illusion that you were going to do other stuff. You know, like there was this like, you know, like, oh, maybe I'll be a painter or maybe I'll be, you know, I'll do advertising or graphic design. Like in my head, I'm like, but I'm going to make comics, you know, but yeah. you got to at least for the adults in the room, like pretend like there's other types of art out there. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, because particularly at that time, it seemed like you could plausibly make the argument to adults that, uh, that you could make a career in comics, you know, particularly looking at there's Rob Liefeld on television doing a jeans commercial, you know? Uh, well, prior to me going to school, yes. Like in high school, absolutely, because that was the time. Like, So I was yeah. going to high school during the height of yeah. that. And then as I got to art school, there was a well, it was the bus. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there was all sorts of articles coming out. And you could definitely feel the vibe in the room. So, like, I, so some of my teachers were Joe Orlando, who had run DC Comics for years, Carmine Infantino, huh? Klaus Jansen, and these guys were all telling me the future is bleak. <laughs> like, like they, they were like they they loved comics, you know, but there was definitely this sense of like, you know, try other things in addition to comics because we can't we can't promise you that the industry is going to stay the same. And a lot of newspaper you know, news, newspapers were shutting down, strips were getting canceled. Um, and the graphic novel boom hadn't happened. You know, that was, that was kind of like, I don't even know if anybody was imagining that that was going to happen. I think the closest thing too was what I was seeing with like slave labor graphics, where it was like, yeah. you know, you can do these like indie black and white comics. Cause like Joan and Vasquez had a huge hit with Johnny, the homicidal maniac. And the idea that something so personal and so authentic to who he was could somehow become this, like, you know, like you look at like, it'd be like, you know, what it would say, like 20th print run or something like right. that. And um, so I think that was the only model that I had of, you know, if I'm going to do comics, maybe it's going to have to look like that. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, like, I, I think I increasingly realized as I was, you know, going to art school will change your perspective on what you're good at because prior to going to art school, I think I thought like I could do any kind of comics I want. And then when I got there, I was going to school with some amazing artists uh, who were so much better at like drawing human anatomy and action scenes and perspective and things like that, that I think it helped me kind of like pivot more towards the cartoonier side of things where not as many people were doing it, honestly. And it was something that I felt like I could have a lot of fun with. Yeah, no, especially in that sort of mid-90s period, uh, there was not a lot of people doing cartoony stuff. Not not cartoony like, like big eyes cartoony. Uh, right, yeah, well, there was, you know, there was like in the underground, there was like Pete Bag was still, you know, sure. kind of a big name. Um, and then Jeff Smith, you know, was publishing bone. And that's another, that was another you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. role model of like, wow, look at, you know, look, look what he's doing. And at that time, you know, he was doing it all himself. And yep. I remember when they, he teamed up with uh, Mark Crilly, who was doing Akiko and Jill Thompson, who was doing scary Godmother. And they had that uh, something called the trilogy tour uh, with Charles Vess. And they, yep. they were going to comic conventions and, you know, so they were kind of building it themselves much the way that like the image comics guys kind of were too. So I think I was very much in the, like, I guess we just have to build it <laughs> yeah. and, 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 you know, and reach out to the comic show. You know, like I, I still have so many memories of me, you know, finding lists of like all the cool comic shops and like reaching out to retailers and mailing them comics and stuff, to, you know, to try to like, get on their radar and try to connect with them and stuff. Um, because I, I don't think I saw how, 
you know, DC comics or Marvel comics was going to necessarily work for me personally. Yeah. I saw on, uh, on a Wikipedia that you interned at DC. I did. Yeah. Yeah. And it was amazing. It was definitely like one of the best experiences. Um, yeah, I was really lucky. Um, I was friends with an artist named Gerard Way, who mm -hmm. has gone on to you know be an amazing comics guy and musician. Yep. Uh, he had interned, I think, the semester before I did, uh, and he recommended you know that he had a really good experience with it. So I signed up for that, um, and I interned for a woman named Dana Curtin, who edited tons of stuff, but specifically the Cartoon Network books. Um, and that was actually a pivotal moment for me because uh, when I when I initially got there, I was one of two interns and they told me I was going to intern in the Batman department. Mm. And this other guy was going to intern on the Scooby-Doo books. Right. Uh, and I could see a little tear dropping down this guy's eye. And he was like so sad. Like, you know, he's like, oh, OK. You know, he was trying to keep his cool, but I could tell that like he was a little disappointed. Uh, so we swapped. I said, uh, hey, do you want to? Do you want to do the Batman books? Like I'll do Scooby Doo. I don't care. Uh -huh. um, which, even though I loved Batman a lot, uh, actually way more than I like Scooby Doo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I probably only watched a few Scooby Doo's in my life, but I read a lot of Batman comics. Um, but because of that, I you know it was a very you know fate moment because Dana and I became like really thick friends, and she introduced me to Chris Duffy, who had been writing Scooby Doo comics at the time, and Chris Duffy had formerly worked at uh, DC comics and now was working at Nickelodeon and Chris and I, you know, really hit it off and he ended up hiring me as his assistant. Um, so all through my twenties, I was working at Nickelodeon under Chris Duffy. Um, and it's all because of that internship that, you know, it led to, you know, amazing, amazing things for me personally. Um, yeah. And it was a great time. I met a lot of cool people at DC and got a lot of free comics. Yeah. For any any kids who are watching, just so so you guys know, uh, Nickelodeon at the time, right? Well, in, in addition to anything else, but they published their own comics magazine. Uh, it was an anthology magazine uh, that, I mean, I, I don't know what the circulation was at its height, but it seemed like it was pretty popular to me. <laughs> Even when it got canceled, it was like at a million copies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> People are like now like, wait, circulation was a million copies and they canceled it. Mm -hmm, <laughs> it's mm -hmm, like yeah, people mm -hmm. were not you know it's changing yeah. times yeah no so we're all for all of you who think that nickelodeon is only a television network they they also had their own comic book magazine where uh where a lot of people got started yeah and it was super fun and i you know like that was my uh you know i graduated sva and then my master's degree is really working at nickelodeon because chris taught me so much about the history of comics about all these other cartoonists that i had never heard of like chris is Chris loves comics. Like he is so, you know, like he, you know, would like get the uh, like old newspaper comic strips, like off the internet, like stuff we'd never heard of, you know, like all the like rare stuff. Um, and he was like a big fan of like a lot of like the older guys in comics and stuff. And I would like m introduce him to like people from like, you know, who were doing like indie comics and stuff, not like that he knew indie comics too, but like the younger people and, just between the two of us, it would just be like, we would just nerd out about, you know, comics and cartooning and, and we'd just get to hire whoever we wanted and just have a blast. Like yeah. making really cool. Like I literally got to call Sergio Aragones, you know, to do like a random bit. And then Chris could call Stan Lee and have him write something. And then Mike Mignola would draw something. And it was just like, what is this power that we have? Yeah. 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 When did you start drawing comics yourself? Always. Um, I mean, I probably even when I was like 10 years old, I was drawing some kind of a comic, you know, mixing the words and pictures. Um, I mentioned that I, the Transformer comics I was really into, I would yeah. be drawing my own Transformer comics. Um, and then that kind of, do you have any of those uh, still today? I've got, I've got scraps of things. Yeah. I've got some stuff. I don't know if I have the transformer comics, but I do have paper transformers that I made. Like I basically uh -huh. did like paper dolls yeah. of transformers um, that could actually fold and turn into different things. Um, I have some old comics. I, my mom really didn't start saving stuff until I was probably more like middle school age or, or right. I, I say my mom, <laughs> I probably had 
more power to stop my mom from throwing things away <laughs> uh, by the time I got to middle school. So the sure. archivists in, in me kicked in around that time. Yeah. Um, so I definitely have a lot of stuff from high school and late middle school, but the elementary school stuff is probably lost to the sands of time. Yeah. Yeah. So when did you start drawing comics for actual publication as opposed to just making your own thing at home? Yeah, well, it that it there's a weird blurred, you know, transitionary area, because uh, like even while I was going to SVA, I was, you know, self publishing and yeah. making my own comics and selling, you know, so I was like selling stuff to comic shops, you know, yeah. through you know, distributed through Diamond distributors and stuff. Um, but I don't think I like I think I was like 30 years old when I got the Astronaut Academy book okay. deal. Uh, but prior to that, I was doing stuff like in the flight anthologies and like uh -huh. lots of, um, you know, sort of, yeah, like a, there's probably some other anthologies that I did some stuff for that I'm forgetting. So was this, was this post Nickelodeon or were during. you still at? Yeah, during. during. I mean, that was one of the great things about Nickelodeon was that I was able to continue to pursue my own personal stuff simultaneously uh -huh. um, as long as it wasn't. You know, like if I got home at eleven o'clock at night, from eleven o'clock till three in the morning, I was drawing my own uh, comics. I was doing web comics uh, at that time, photocopying stuff, um, and I was pitching things to different people, and I was writing stuff for other people as well. So I was like still playing in the sandbox as much as I could in every yeah. type of different comic. Um, yeah. Astronaut Academy was for second, yeah, 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 and that was in a lot of ways like that for me, it was like the big, you know, that was my big break, I guess. Um, because up until that, I think I was known more as a writer. I think I was, you know, at least for money, you know, like this, like, like I was drawing comics the whole time, yeah. but as far as like, will someone pay me in advance to draw something or will you pay me like after I've drawn it and then I'm selling it to you at a comic convention, Astron Academy was sort of the, you know, the eventual like, Oh, I could I can draw a graphic novel for a publisher, um, and yeah, first second was amazing, and I was already a fan of of their stuff, and it was exciting to uh, to have that happen, and it, and that's when I entered into like the book world too, because up until that point, you know, like I knew your stuff, you know, I was reading your your no columns, I, you know, I was I felt like I was a comic book guy, I definitely felt like I was like, you know, I knew comic shops, I knew the comic book world. Um, and then suddenly I was being sent to ALA, American Library Association conferences, yeah. teachers conferences, um, BEA. And it was just like this whole, it was like, you know, a whole new education uh, in like what was going on in like traditional publishing and sort of, you know, how it was kind of crossing over with comics because comics, Scholastic for a second, um, Simon & Schuster, Random House, like all of those guys were all dabbling you know, into the comics world. Um, and librarians were like, you know, I, I always say like librarians kind of help move the needle on that stuff too, because um, I did well, a, a culture shift there, you know, huge because, culture I mean, yeah. certainly, you know, in let's say the eighties and before librarians were like any other academics and were comics aren't serious. Comics aren't real. They're, they're they don't have any value. And I, I I tend to think I tend to think that it was Mouse winning the Pulitzer that that made people go oh wait a minute there's actually potentially something here. Well, you know, it was what they could use right because I would I, I feel like there was always people like Cat Can like mm -hmm. or, you know librarians who were big comics fans who sure. appreciated it and got it but they probably couldn't convince the powers that be to listen to them or give them money or you know and you're right that I think once that book once mouse you know ch it changed the conversation for sure yeah yeah and then watchmen and dark knight made superhero comics seem legitimate and uh and yeah and as you said bone you know would probably be the next big tipping point there you know um yeah lots of stuff was happening you know it was, yeah. it was exciting times and, and even just um like so like i was self-publishing a series in college with my buddy, John Patrick Green uh, called Jack's Epoch and the Quicken Forbidden for those people who remember. Uh, 
and you know initially we were distributing it through diamond and we were you know self-publishing it black and white floppy periodicals and i do feel like there was like a wall of how many people like like even like a cool comic shop would order a few there weren't necessarily the people who would buy it coming into the stores right so like i would have like a really strong advocate like at a comic shop but not necessarily the audience shopping at that comic shop whereas once um like and so we did a test run with this like this guy Harold Buckholz helped us figure out how to self publish a graphic like a trade paperback version of those books. Yeah. And even that was like ding 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 like suddenly it shifted. Like there was like a different people would respond to it differently, different people would check it out and then we were able to get it into libraries all of a sudden and it had opened it up, you know, to a newer world and then um Larry Young had a publisher called AIT Planet Lar and yep. they did the they did like a nicer version of our trade paperback mm -hmm. and that was like you know the numbers were so much better because they were like it, you know something about it being a book somehow uh it just you know it changed people's view on it um and yeah like you were saying like there was something in the water that was shifting and everybody's everybody was kind of like getting more and more open to it and you were seeing lots of blogs were popping up like no yep. flying no tights and um school library journals, good comics for yeah. kids. No, I mean, I, absolutely. The librarians followed very quickly by the teachers, um, I think made such a huge difference. You know, I don't think that uh, 15, 20 years ago, if if I were talking to teachers, that, that most of them would be, oh yeah, no comics. But something happened and it was probably around the time sort of between Bone to, to Raina, I guess, somewhere in that period uh where yeah, Fred thompson was in there too with the, yeah. the blankets book yeah. and it was that was a, such a big deal when that came out yeah yeah and then the, and then you could just see this whole wave of teachers going you know we're trying to get kids to read and and these these kids read these and they don't just read them they like voraciously yeah. <laughs> you know like like yeah. they're into it um and and there's so you know, if you have a reluctant reader, uh, it, it makes it really easy to to get them to be a confident reader if they can read something where where they can decipher it on their own, that they're not fully bound by, you know, by the prose. Um, and it's it's important, you know, I think. Uh, and and that shift, you know, I again, I think made a really big difference in 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 what happened culturally with comics. Uh, at that yeah. Point. It's exciting. you know, to be a part of that, to, to, to watch it happening, to, you know, to see what was hitting, what wasn't hitting. Yeah. And like you said, like people, it's, it's so fun when like, you know, these kids are so excited about the books, you know, too, or it's like you say, like, it's, it's, you know, like I, like whenever people ask me like oh what's the reading levels for your comic i'm like i have no idea because i meet kids who are like these little kids and they're reading my books and then i have people that are 17 years old and they're reading my books and it's the same book yep and they love it and it you yep. know they, they connect with it on a different level yep and they can get different stuff out of it and that's awesome Yep. No, I mean, I, it, the same thing happens with the kids club all the time. You know, people are like, well, what ages are it for? I'm like, I don't want to say ages there. It's for middle readers yeah. and a middle reader can start at six, you know, or they can start at 12 or, you know, like, and there's adults who are still middle readers essentially, you know? Uh, so yeah, it's interesting. Well, let's, let's, uh, yeah. let's, let's put a pin in all of that, that history stuff. Cause because nobody, no, no kid wants to hear any of that. I, you <laughs> two, know. Old, two old men talking about calling. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was, I was given a note by my producer that we should like really like go, go to the, to the, the current book much earlier in the conversation, and I never do it because, because we go down these interesting rabbit holes. But, uh, but let's talk about Unicorn Boy. Where, where the heck did this come from? I don't know. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out. Um. I, the, the clearest memory that I have is that I was, you know, I've always been a doodler. So I've always, there's tons of sketchbooks with all sorts of random characters. So, you know, there's characters that, you know, may never see the light of day and then some that'll surface and some that'll manifest in some different way. 
Um, but I was really into a show called Jim Henson's The Storyteller mm -hmm. uh, that retold classic fables and myths and um, fairy tales, but in like really twisty, weird ways, you know, and, and then with Jim Henson puppets and stuff. Um, and John Hurt, who's just an amazing actor, would just narrate these stories like you'd never heard them before. Like he's telling you the story of Cinderella, but like you don't even realize it's the story of Cinderella till like 20 minutes in. You're like, oh, wait right. a second. This is basically Cinderella um, because they wouldn't call it Cinderella. They would change it. And it's just so fun. And, and, and I knew I wanted to do something like that, but with my own voice and sort of that sort of played to my own strengths as a cartoonist, things that would be fun to draw thing, you know, like kind of like you're saying, like the kind of weird twisty stuff. Um, and initially I thought maybe it would be an anthology of fractured fairy tales. Um, so I was thinking of like, I was going through all my sketchbooks trying to find different characters I could focus on and different ideas that I could pull from. But the unicorn kid, like a kid with a unicorn horn, for some reason, just at that time, like I think if I had looked at it 10 years earlier, I probably wouldn't have felt the same way. But right. something about where I was in that time in my life and kind of what I was feeling was just kind of like, I just identified with it in a stronger way. And kind of, I think I just thought of kids in my life and just different, you know, kind of, what it would be like to suddenly like be the center of attention when you don't want to be the center of attention and sort of have this thing that you can't hide, which is the unicorn horn. Like there's nothing he can do to hide it. That was the initial idea was that he would want to hide it, but he can't hide it. Yeah. Um, and then has to kind of just deal with it and just be like, yep, this is what I am. I'm a unicorn kid. Yeah. This is who I am. Um, and then it just kind of spiraled out from there um, as so many things do like, a lot of my influences in video games and comics and other, you know, anime that I had seen and stuff kind of, you know, melted into the pot um, until I came, you know, before I knew it, I had the whole story kind of worked out. Oh, interesting. Um, so what did you, when you say you had it worked out, was this worked out as in you're taking showers and you're coming up with the, the plot or like, did you, were you like formally writing stuff down yet at this point? Yeah. The showers is the, the, most of my writing is the showers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So unlike perhaps anything else I've ever done um, at this point in my life, I was, I was kind of in between projects. I had started editing again. Um, I was editing at first second doing their science comics books and the history comics series. And so that was like occupying like one side of my brain where it was like nonfiction, 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 nonfiction. So I think in my part, you know, my, what little free time I had, I kind of really wanted to do something really extremely in the other direction where it was like very not, you know, very fiction, very weird, very silly. Um, and I had been pitching a bunch of different things. I had a bunch of different stuff. Um, and I almost never show things to agents like uncooked, but unicorn boy was, I would say a little uncooked. Like I, I knew it would be like this kid who would become kind of like a superhero with unicorn powers. And there would be other mythological creatures that he would interact with. That was all I really had. But when I showed it to my agent, um, she said, drop everything else and work on this. Like, this is, this is what you got to focus on. Um, and I've never had a reaction like that. I've, uh -huh. I always feel like people are like, oh, okay, maybe this. Oh yeah, we'll see. Well, you know, and unicorn boy was like, do it, <laughs> just do it. Um, and I ended up getting a book deal like pretty quickly after that. Like, I, I think I had done like a couple of pages. Um, I did some test pages, sent that over to first second and they were like, great do it uh let me ask you a question and, and and you can answer this any way you want to was it easier or harder for you because you had worked it for a second like like the pro because i asked this particularly because because we interviewed mike caballero last week love him or last month uh and I guess he had been he had been working with first second so long that he basically just verbally pitched the idea, you know, and then yeah. it was like, 
cool. Go. You know? <laughs> I know. I was really jealous listening to that interview. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so what's what's the experience for you as someone who was on the inside? Um, uh, it, was that was it harder or easier to pitch at that point? Well, specifically for Unicorn Boy, it was easier. Okay. But the missing piece to this, and I think even Mike probably alluded to this a little bit, is that just because you have this relationship with the publisher, just because, and you know, in my case, like I've edited, I think like 30 books for them. Mm-hmm. And I've done two Astronaut Academy books. I've been in some of their anthologies. Like I've done a lot of stuff for, for a second. Still doesn't mean that they love everything that I do. <laughs> right. You know, there's still ideas that I brought them that they were not into. Um, and in one case, you know, like I think there's an entire graphic novel on my computer hard drive that I've drawn. And for a second, was like, and for a second was like, eh, just not for us. Uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. Not that they don't like it, but uh-huh. just not for them. Um, so I didn't know that they would be into Unicorn Boy. I didn't know, you know, and, and like I said, yeah. I had other projects that I was cooking up at the same time that I might have even been more into, to be quite honest, like at the time. Um, but yes, absolutely. You know, publishing is relationships. So the fact that like Callista Brill is going to answer my calls. Mark Siegel is going to answer my emails. Um, you know, they're happy to look at what I've, what I've done. Luckily, you know, I feel, and I'm really grateful for that, you know, that, that, um, because I know I teach at school of visual arts right now and I'm teaching seniors who are graduating and I'm prepping them to do their book pitches and stuff. And I, you know, I, I have so much anxiety for them and so much stress because I know how much harder that is when you don't know people and you don't have those relationships. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm asking, then the work has to speak for itself essentially. Right. And for some people more power to them. Right. Like, but I've never felt that. Right. Like I, 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 I've always felt like for me, it's a little bit of a mix of personality, hard work, mm-hmm. the books themselves, you know, um, because like when I had teen boat published by Clarion, you know, that was a chance that somebody took, you know, like that was not a surefire, you know, it was about a kid who transformed into a boat. Uh-huh. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a, you know, for certain people, it's an easy sell and other people are like, what are you talking about? Um, but Daniel Nyeri, who was the editor at the time, like he was like, yeah, like, I like it. You guys seem cool. Let's do this. Yeah. Um, I think all that stuff can help. Yeah. What? So, um, uh, I guess I, the next question I would ask then is, is the advice that you're giving your students at SVA, like how does that compare to your own experience in, in pitching a book? Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, did, are you, did you put together for Unicorn Boy a similar package that you would be advising your students to do or was it, was yeah, it I was. looser? Yeah, because I I think I learned from my previous failed pitch. Um, I think I sent that uncooked. You know, like I think I gave them, you know, pancake batter yeah. um, instead of a finished pancake. I, there was a lot of sketchy art. There was, a, you know, like I basically sent them like lettered thumbnails and maybe two or three pages of finished art. Um, and as I was working on the book, like I, I don't think, I don't think they really saw what it was going to be fully. Like, I don't think, you know what I mean? Like I I was leaving too much up to the imagination. And I think with unicorn boy, I feel like I had to make a stronger effort to really show people. This is what I'm talking about. This is what it's going to be. This is the proof of concept. Um, And I think that helped. So yeah, I, I, I definitely push my students to not leave things, you know, in your head, you know, like there's, it's so hard, you know, like we can be so excited about something, but there's, you know, we're not directly mind melding with editors. You know, we actually have to, there's there's this intermediary step. We have to figure out like, how do we show what's in our head, like on a piece of paper or on a PDF or something that gets them excited. Yeah. How, what do you think of how, like, do you think that it is it is healthy, I guess, for 20-year-olds coming out of a program like SVA to be pitching books 
do you, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. like okay, so so you're you're young. You really have no life experience. You barely know what you're doing in terms of craft. Two hundred pages, go right. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I know, like. I can't remember if it was John Allison or there was like some interview you did with someone where you guys were talking about like periodicals, you know, yeah. versus graphic novels. And I definitely come from the, I wish, I wish it was still periodicals, you know, or like, you know, or magazines or, you know, something, some way of doing this stuff because yeah, like working on a book for three years, four years in a vacuum, it is not great for your mental health. <laughs> it is not good. Um, and it's hard without that kind of feedback loop to c encourage you, you know, like I'm super buzzed to work on unicorn boy too. Now that book one came out, but there was a window where I had to start working on all this stuff without even knowing, like, I didn't know if anybody was going to like unicorn boy outside of like, you know, the five people at first second who right. had read it. So it's hard to like really dive into a sequel and a follow up, you know, yeah. without even knowing like, do people even like these characters? Like, is this right. working or, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's tough. Like I, I understand that that is the model that is, you know, we're, we're all trying to meet the moment as far as the demand. Um, but I do think there is a reckoning to come as far as like how the effect on cartoonists is going to be in the long term. So yeah. I yeah, I mean, you can talk of it too, right? Like, I mean, as you said, some people it takes them four and five years to get that, to get that manuscript fixed. And you know, when you've 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 got what you thought was a nice advance on the book, but you know, you only got a quarter of it up front, mm -hmm. and you don't get the next quarter until you've turned in a substantial portion of it, and then you don't get the next quarter until after the book's about to print. You know, like it doesn't, it like economically, it really doesn't work for a lot of people. You know, I, 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 this is one of my big concerns, honestly, with, you know, especially when we have multiple schools that are graduating people and graduating in, them into an environment where because it takes years to make these things, you might be making something for an audience that will no longer exist by the time that you that it actually comes out, you know? Absolutely. Like every day I was working on Unicorn Boy, there was a, I can't remember who it was, but someone, I, I want to say like in the market, in a marketing department or some marketing person that I met said, yeah, unicorns are really big right now, but there could be a crash in like two years. And then there'll be like a unicorn backlash. And like, <laughs> unicorn <you're>, backlash. <laughs> where people are going to be like, oh, unicorns, enough. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, because we've seen that happen, right? Yeah, Remember sure. the big vampire boom, you know, and then people are like, nothing with vampire. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, so absolutely. And that's why I, you know, I told my students, you can't do it to chase the fads. You have to do it because you love it. There has to be something that it, you know, it has to come from you. It has to speak to you so that uh, even if the world, and it's heartbreaking. Like, you, you know, you can make a book and the reception isn't there. Right. But if at least you look at it, like I mentioned Teen Boat, like Teen Boat did not connect in the book market. It connected in the zine market. Like when I did as mini comics, people loved it. When I did as a book, people were like, eh, okay, you know, but I look at the book, I can still pick up that book and it, and I laugh. It makes me happy. And that's for me, like, like that's at least then I have that. Um, cause that's the only part we can control. And that's, yeah. I think what I try to focus on is like, what can I actually control? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you're absolutely right. And, and I think one of the things as a teacher, I, I, I really care about my students and I'm really looking, you know, I always tell them, it's like, I don't, you know, I want to, I want you to be in this 20 years later. I want you to be, you know, I want you to, I want to see you in 20 years and you'd be like, yeah, I'm excited about what I'm doing. Not it killed me, <laughs> you know, it burnt me out. It exhausted me. Um, so it's, it is tricky. Um, and you would have a better sense, you know, again, about the economics of all that. Like, but I agree, like if we were doing periodicals or some smaller, you know, smaller batches, I think that would be great. And I, yeah. you know, I come from magazines. So, you know, like I loved doing comics magazines. Um, and yeah, no, I mean, I, I honestly wish this scholastic uh, would, would publish an anthology 
comics. Yeah, like in the UK, they've got this great magazine called The Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And a lot of the guys that are kind of blowing up over in the UK are, you know, their comics are starting off as these like shorter form comics in The Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, uh, again, I I absolutely think that a Scholastic anthology would sell a million copies a month really easily. Well, especially because they've got the distribution already, right? Like they, you know, they already have the book clubs and all that stuff. So it's like, it's kind of a no brainer. Yep. Yep. And, you know, and well, I mean, and you can tell me as someone who's worked on both sides of this, but it seems to me like it would be fairly simple to serialize graphic novels that are in production, you know, and go. For some, right? I mean, like, obviously, everybody everybody works different, right? And some sure. people would, I think it lends itself to certain people versus other. Like, even when I was at Nickelodeon, we mostly did short form stuff, like really short stuff. So, like, two pages, four pages, six pages. If we did an eight page comic, that was like, you know, woohoo, we did an eight page comic. Um, and that's not for everybody. Like, not everybody can wrap their head around that. Not everyone can think in that way. Um, so, even if you followed like the Shonen Jump manga model, like that's a specific, you know, pay in amount of pages. You have sure. to be able to think in those beats and those breaks. Sure. But I think you can train yourself to do it. If there's an industry for it, yeah. It's like television. Up until five years ago, everybody had to write television with commercial breaks. You know, you had to know where your commercial breaks were. Mm-hmm. Um, back in classic comic days, you had to know where the ad breaks were, you mm-hmm. know. Like, uh, so mm-hmm. I think we could all learn it if there's mm-hmm. if there's an industry for mm-hmm. it. And even even when those things go away, they still end up coming back. I mean, today, new television shows, you still you have to book for those commercial breaks because you know that it's eventually going to have commercials someday. Maybe not when it's actually streaming the first time. Well, I mean, this is totally off topic, but that would be great if that were true all the time. But there's a few cases where they don't. And right, what's so right. frustrating is when they have ads in the in most random of places. Yeah, sure. You know, and sometimes in some of these apps, like you're doing like an old, like, like an old sitcom, which has very clear commercial break places, but that's not where they put their commercials. They interrupt like the flow of the storytelling. Right. Um, but that's just my own little pet peeve. Yeah. I was, I was just watching fallout on, uh, on prime this week and, it, and every eight to 12 minutes, the screen goes to black. Yeah, you yeah. know, for like three seconds, and you know that that's where they're going to put. They're going to slot the commercials in there. You know, yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know. Again, in terms of comics, I think it's I think it's good to to build the muscles on telling short stories, right? And to get to the point within five to six pages, you know, because I think that does nothing but make better graphic novels at the end of the day, right? Um, yeah, I think you're right. I actually had a one-on-one chat with one of my students this week and in a way she kind of checked me because I think I kind of was hoping for her to like get a book deal pretty soon. And like, you know, because I see the potential there and, and I know there's certain editors that would really dig her work, but she was very clear that she was like, no, I want to work on some short stuff. Like I want to just do short form stuff for a little bit. Uh And, and I was like, you're smarter than me. <laughs> like, you know, like I go, like, it's so great that you see that because I do think that that's probably the healthier approach. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about your work process a little bit. Um, uh, you have a piece of blank paper in front of you or, or a, a blinking cursor on your screen. What do you do? What, uh, what, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do, hot shot? Come on. <laughs> I just start drawing. I just start doodling. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah. I love doodling. Um, you know, when I'm on the phone, if I'm just like sitting, you know, in a boring place, I'm just always doodling. Um, so my comics generally start with like, I just take eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper and fold them in half. Mm -hmm. And I just start making comic panels and stuff, but they're very loose. They're very sketchy. They're not meant to be seen by anybody else. Um, they're barely even thumbnails. Um, it's just to get blocking and sort of ideas down and that's just kind of how the flow of ideas come out and then when i have enough of that i kind of step back and you know kind of look at it and 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 you know are these working as scenes and then and then at some point i'll start scanning that stuff uh and organize it like into kind of like a pdf of a book or something um to share with someone okay so are you um 
are you not writing a formal script then you're just you're thumbnailing and then seeing what works and then then going to the next step of art yeah like when i worked on books with like john patrick green and stuff i would write scripts for him mm -hmm. um and sometimes do like little doodles to go with yeah. that but i for myself yeah writing a script doesn't do much for me yeah. um i have written outlines from time to time and they're very loose yeah i'm definitely one of those uh like i took a writing class at sva that you know for the first time you like really really focus on like you got to know the ending of your story and all that and I've known the ending of maybe three out of 30 of my stories. So uh, a lot of my stories is yes. And, and just building off of things and logical story. And I've just digested so many stories that I just kind of know the beats of like what feels good to read and what, it, what, it, you know, page turns and all that kind of stuff. So I, I don't really, yeah, I don't really type too much. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would particularly think that with a book like unicorn boy, it, it doesn't seem like it, it feels like you were making it up as you went along. Essentially. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was an end goal. Where, you I know, mean, you're a good way, right? I don't mean towards bad this goal, way. Yeah. But uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's, I kind of, for myself, like, again, like I didn't know that Unicorn Boy was going to connect with people. Like, so for me, this was, I have to have fun with it. And for me, part of the fun is you find yourself in a, it's like a video game or something. It's like you find yourself in a room what's in the room? What do you do with the stuff? Like, you know, here are the characters, what happens when they're in the room together? You know, when you put this person next to this person, what happens? Take this person away, what happens? You know, like all my storytelling kind of comes from play. Yeah, yeah. How do you, um, given that, how do you get to your 200 pages properly? If you see what I'm saying, right? Because it seems to me like that could yield you a 400 page first draft, right? You know? mm -hmm. I mean, luckily you get exhausted at a certain point. Okay. <laughs> there's, like, okay. there's only so much you can do before the burnout kicks in. Um, yeah, I do worry about that actually. I do think that that's a valid concern. Um, I think I, you know, in addition to doing my own books, I've edited a lot of other people's books. Sure. So I think that's the, you know, the DNA of that, or, you know, like I'm just absorbing so much story and I, you know, and I'm someone, I just love story. Like I, you know, like, like in my free time, I like listen to podcasts about storytelling and, you know, deconstructing movies and, yeah. and, you know, uh, why things work, why don't, you know, and so, f so for me, like it's, I've always been an editor. Like I was always the guy who like, like I remember seeing Jurassic Park, you know, which is like one of the most beloved movies. And I would be like, in the, you know, the, the second act, like it could have had a little of this, a little, you know, like I was always like a little more of that, a little bit, of, you know. Um, so I think I'm always running my own stuff through that filter. Um, yeah. And one of the things I do is, I, so I keep an InDesign document where I'm constantly assembling the book and looking at it so I can sort of figure out how it's flowing. Um, and I think that's, you know, where a lot of the editing happens in that way. Yeah. Are you, um, how many pages are you thumbnailing at a time? So I'm on the slow, like that's the, that's the, uh, the million dollar question with all cartoonists sure. these days, especially with like the demand for series and stuff. Yeah. Um, thumbnailing, I could do a couple of pages in a day. Um, yeah. if, if it's, you know, if I know what the story is and it's, you know, and it's flowing, that's never been a problem especially because luckily I don't have to show people my thumbnails to be that clean. Like if it was for another artist or something like that, it would be trickier. Sure. Um, yeah. For me, it's the drawing itself that takes the longest. Like, yeah. I, well, so, but let me, let me back up. I, my question actually was how, how much do you thumbnail before you go, okay, now I'm going to take these 10 pages and I'm going to tighten them and formalize them and make them better. Or are you doing 50 pages at a time? Or are you doing it in three pages? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it is definitely book specific. Um, okay. And with Unicorn Boy, I would say it's maybe like 10 page bursts. Okay. Um, maybe, you know, 10 to 15, 20 pages tops. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then I step away. 
like for my, like a lot of the process is stepping away. A lot of it is like work on it, step away, reread it. Mm-hmm. Is it still hitting? And and if it's hitting, it generally inspires more. Like, so if yeah. I'm like reading and I'm like, Ooh, I like the way this is going. Then it like the logical extension tends to flow out. But if it doesn't, then it's like, you know, just like, ramp, ramp, it just kind of like stagnates. Yeah. Um, and those are the harder stories. And those are the ones that like, I've got other books, you know, that are like in sort of various levels of completion because like the more time I spend with it, you know, like you can go from thinking your idea is so great and so fun to what is this? Like, what, what am I doing? Like, where is this going? And like, why did I think this was a good idea? Or like, so um, for me, the miracle is when you can just keep riding the wave of like, yeah, I'm still excited about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I 100% understand that. Um, do you, when do you start involving an editor or other people who give you feedback, whether it's your formal editor or not? Yeah, usually f- very far into it. Okay. Um, I'm a hard time. Uh, I, I, I can't remember. I think it was like Scotty Young or somebody said like, you know, if you tell your story, like at a party, like in a way it's like, then you don't have to draw it. Um, I feel that way with like unfinished things sometimes. Like if it's like, if it's too rough, I'm a little scared to share it. I, I kind of like want you to see it for what it really is. Right. Um, so that usually means that I have to do more work, sadly. Mm-hmm. Um, I do dream of that Mike Cavalera phone call conversation where you can just be like, hey boss, this is what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Do it. Uh-huh. Um, and then you so, come back to 200 finished pages and they're like, cool, we'll print it. That's the dream for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, for a second, still very, you know, what I love about them, they are very creator centric and they do sure. believe in creators. Um, and, and I think in my case, what I will say in my own defense is that as an editor myself, I'm very harsh on my own stuff as well. And, you know, nothing is being shown by the time. Uh, so we had an editor, Steve Fox, who worked on the first unicorn boy book by the time he looked at it, I'd been editing the hell out of it, you know, and chopping it out and removing things. Entire characters were removed. Scenes were shifted around. So it's not like I just like spewed a bunch of stuff out and then said, what do you think? You know, like I was scrutinizing it a lot. Um, And then, you know, but even then it's really great to have somebody else in there because there's definitely things that like Steve saw that was like, I really like this, but what about that? And you're just like, that is good point. <laughs> it's good to have somebody else uh, in there sometimes. Yeah. And is this, is this all still in a thumb or thumb ish kind of phase or, or have you started doing, um, uh, I don't know, pr- pr- production level artwork by that point? Generally it's thumbs every now okay. and then I do feel like I have to draw something more. Like if it's something newish or something that's like yeah. kind of hard to explain, um, I'll probably do more like, yeah. you know, at least pencils. Uh-huh. Um, but the goal, at least once you have a series going is that you don't have to keep doing that stuff. Sure. You know, like at this point it's like, you know who the characters are, you know what the world is. Sure. Um, you just, but like in the second unicorn boy book, I introduced a bunch of new characters. So there's like, pages that were like full color just to, because I wanted to show you what they looked like. And I wanted to show you, you know, like these are the different colors they are. This is how we're going to keep track of who these characters are. Um, so I had to do more work for that. But outside sure. of that, the, the best case is you have an editor who totally gets it. They understand what you're doing and you can just share really rough stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Just, you know, just trying to feel you out here. Cause yeah, you know, yeah, again, yeah. again um, we have those conversations with guys like Mike who are like, you know, I, I I, I boggle at being allowed to work that way, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, he, he does great work, so obviously it works, but uh, I, it's surprising to me sometimes, you know? Uh, yeah, and I will say, you know, this is what we all love about comics, right? Like, in yeah, comics, yeah. Uh, you have the room to hang yourself. You know, they give you the rope to hang yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas you know, working in animation, working in, you know, sort of larger productions, so much money on the line, people are not gonna let you do that. You know, they, yeah. they, everybody's gonna like metal, everyone's gonna get their hands in it just to make sure like we're all, you know, we're not gonna lose money on this thing, right? Yeah. Um, whereas I think comics and books, people take a lot more chances and people are like willing to see, you know, what happens if we just give this guy total freedom? Like, let's see what happens. Sure. It could be, it could be pretty cool. 
it could be sure. and, and and some you know amazing books have have come out of that process um hey can i show you real quick uh please do the screen share uh thing because it actually segues with what you were just talking about please um, love the process <laughs> let's show the process um all right can you see artwork up on the screen yeah yep. there you go yep. cool um so this was the, like one of the test pages like so this was like the proof of concept uh spread yeah that i did to sort of show like what the book would look like um and then boop, boop, boop. yeah this is just like a page from the book real quick uh hold on i'm gonna zoom out i wanted to get to thumbnail page okay so yeah so this is what i was talking about when i'm writing so this would be an example of like a writing thumbnail yeah where so this is the scene where uh they go into avery's basement and avery's parents have converted the basement into like a giant like almost comics and toy museum um and you know you can just sort of see that like it's so easy to just write that like it's just like okay like they're in the basement uh those little there's like indication of like comics long boxes in there um and then and that can take me minutes to draw yeah. and then i actually have to draw the page and actually figure out the logistics of the basement the staircase the yeah. comic you know the perspective what toys are going to be in the in there um and this probably took me like over a week <laughs> to do right. this page um i mean just this panel alone i think you know at a certain point i had to slap myself on the wrist and say like no one's gonna even like be able to see all of the crazy uh, Star Wars action figures in the background and yeah, like, yeah. like My Little Ponies and He-Man yeah. and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, so that's really the process. Yeah, of especially, especially printed as small as the book actually prints. That's uh, right, which is, that's definitely the, I always forget that the books are a little bit smaller than I think they are. Yeah, well, because um, you know, because uh, you just zoomed in kind of four levels to, to show all that background detail. Yeah. And, that's not uh yeah but in this case i was like i just wanted to know that it was there you know yeah. and it's like and if you see it great if you don't see it that's all right um and then one of the things i just wanted to show which no one has ever seen this you guys anybody watching this feed is you're gonna see this stuff for the first time um so i actually acted out most of the book um so like this is an example of that scene where they're in the looking at the comics and stuff i uh -huh. took photos of myself acting out uh, pretty much everything that they say and do. And um, and I think this is probably a bit of craziness that most cartoonists don't do it. Um, but it was kind of a fun process for me. Um, now, now, do you do that all of the time for your for all, every page or just certain particular shots that you're not quite sure how to visualize? It started with just a few and now it's turned into a lot. Um, like it's not the whole book, uh -huh. but there's definitely like lots of scenes where, because even, okay. So like the reason why I have this one, um, where you see like three different versions of me sitting on the yeah. chair is because like, if I just went and was going to just sit down and draw three people sitting on a couch, my instinct is to kind of draw them very similarly and make them like kind of almost in the same pose. But forcing myself to actually pretend to be the parents and actually act like they would act and respond the way that they respond to the information that is being told to them kind of presented new information that made me realize it's like, no, they would, their gestures would be different, their poses would be different. Um, so that's kind of got me doing it to a lot more scenes. So there's a lot more scenes where, like, even this scene where like Avery is like passed out on the floor. Yeah. Um, I realize like the way that your hand rests, the way that your body goes limp um, is very, very specific. So I wanted to make sure uh, that I was kind of capturing that. So yeah, I actually ended up acting out, like I would say 70% of the book. Wow. And <laughs> and okay, so, so mechanically, who's taking these pictures? Me. Uh, me and uh, my friend, the, uh, the tripod. <laughs> okay. And so you're just like sort of setting it up with a timer or something and then running over and trying yeah. to, yeah. And yeah, yeah. this, so doing it that way, I'm just going to infer 
that this means that you're taking several of the pictures many, many, many times until oh, you yeah, get yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. There's so many pictures. So how many. is it efficient to me, my friend? <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, it, I am a big proponent of whatever it takes, whatever okay. it takes to make the book. Um, but I've seen the difference. And, and it's, mm -hmm. it's actually, uh, to give credit, uh, I when I worked at Nickelodeon, um, I edited a lot of comics based on a show called Avatar The Last Airbender. And working there, we had access to all this like resources and stuff that they did in the production of the show. And I found out that uh, one of the co-creators, Brian Konitsko, he would act out a lot of the animations, like a lot of the scenes that were going to be animated. He created animation reference where he would act out a scene um, and send it to the animators. And I just thought like, that's probably a, a lot of where the, the, I don't know, there's just this extra little touch to some of those scenes that make them a little funnier, a little more interesting, a little more, you know, different um, because Brian really inhabited the characters and and he's got a very sort of like weird personality uh you know very funny you know comic timing and stuff so i think i wanted to see what would happen if i was doing a little bit more of that um to push because i have very simple character designs but i kind of wanted to push them a little bit more with like the body language yeah um because i think my tendency if i didn't do that was to have kind of like talking puppet characters, you know, like it would just kind of be like Punch and Judy or like, you know, sure. uh, Bert and Ernie kind of like, you know, just yeah. like, hello, I'm just standing there. Yeah. But when I act the scenes out, I realize like, oh, I'm leaning, my hand is kind of going out, I'm doing yeah. something with my neck yeah. um, and try to work a little bit more of that stuff into the drawings. Can't, couldn't you achieve essentially the same impact by just having a, a full length mirror across from you that you could you could do that and and then yeah but then i guess i'd have to like like be drawing in real time like with the thing you know what i mean yeah. so like sometimes yeah. it's like it's kind of like a different mode where it's like i'm acting yeah. out some stuff now and then i'm gonna sit yeah. down and draw with it yeah versus like having to draw I'm like, in the mirror. push it back i'm, I'm just asking yeah. questions because i i it, it's a little yes I, I get it but it's a little hard for me to understand you know gotcha. the only other person i know uh, or at least that I can think of who does that kind of photography ahead of time would be Alex Ross. But that's because he's trying to nail super photorealistic pictures. Right. right? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, you're yeah. not doing photorealism at all. I, no, I, and I, that's actually the, 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 the extra step there is like I have to dilute it so that it stays into the like simplistic cartoony stuff because – my proportions are not the cartoony proportions. My body moves differently than the way the cartoons move a little bit. Yeah. So there is still, it's not like I can just like trace the photos and then I'm done. Like I, I, I obviously have to like interpret like my body to then like the cartoon kid body. Right. Or cat. Yeah, no, I can, I can see why it, it takes you days to do a, a single page if, <laughs> if this is the process. <laughs> yeah, maybe I shouldn't have said this out loud. <laughs> Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, I love this. This is, you know, I, that might be the best of, of all of these that I've, I've heard in a while. In fact, I'm probably going to use this now. You know, it used to be that my, my go-to conversation was about uh, Anneli Fermark. Uh, uh, she's a Swedish cartoonist who colors her pages first before she draws anything. She, oh. she puts down like the washes of what the color is going to look like and then draws what's suggested by the color. That's cool. But this, I think, tops I like it where you're like photographing it so you get the language, but then you're cartoonifying it so it works as a comic. I, I, I mean, to be fair, that's what Disney animators did back in the day, you know, and stuff like so it's it's like if you watch making of like Peter Pan or Cinderella or whatever. Like sure. there's, there's, there's footage. But of... those characters are moving, right? Right. Those, those <laughs> characters are literally moving yeah. through the scene. So if you have Cinderella doing a dance where she's got to spin yeah. around in a circle, it's probably a good idea to see how that actually works in time and space. Sure. But you're taking a static image. Yeah. And, and, and so there's, there's no need to do that except your need to make it the way that you want to make it. Yeah. I, I think it, there's, I, the I, I love it. I, I'm, I'm yeah, saying that I love it. If that wasn't I, clear. I fully admit that 
90% of what I do is because I need it. Not because like the, I, I love hanging out with other cartoonists. Yeah. But I'm often in awe that like they can see something in their head and just draw it. Like that's like amazing. Yeah. Like, you're, you're just like, Oh, you saw in your head and you just drew it. Awesome. Yeah. I feel like I'm building it. So yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm figuring it out on the page. Now, so that's interesting because, you know, a lot of times I really think that the actual job of making comics is, is actually an editing job where you're, you're trying to crystallize the single perfect image to tell the story so that you can then string those images together, sure. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I wonder how, how that applies with this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I probably didn't ask that question correctly. Maybe, but not, but I agree that editing is the key there. I mean, I yeah. think that a hundred percent, like, you know, in all those different stages, it's really what it's about. And, and for me, like editing is never really totally done because, yeah. you know, you can draw an entire page and be super happy with it. But once you put the balloons on or once you put the lettering in there, it's like, now it doesn't work anymore, you know? So you're still having to use that editor's eye to refine and move things around, pull, you know? Um, so it's, it's all of that. Um, you know, and there'll be times where I'll act out a scene, take photographs and then not use them and say like, sure. you know what, actually, no, just sketch it out. Like it is, you know, it is better to just, you know, I, I'm overthinking it. You know, sometimes I, you know, sometimes the poses can get too complicated. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and especially with my art style, I'm always sort of striving for like a simplistic, yeah, uh, minimal approach to things. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. I, uh, but let's not, let's not spend the whole time talking about only that. Um, uh, do you work physically or digitally? Both. Um, okay. it's definitely a combination, um, with unicorn boy book one, I actually hand inked the first half pretty much until they get into the underworlds. Okay. Um, I, at that point I started playing with digital inking, um, but I was still penciling all the pages. Yeah. Um, and with book two, I've pretty much started the digital inking from page one, although I'm like a hundred pages in and like. Traditional linking starting to sound really good right now. Um, so maybe I'll do the reverse. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I still pen like the, for me, the penciling is really hard to do digital. Um, I didn't grow up with it. I think the people who grew up with it, like all my students are, they, they're inherently just digital people. Yeah. Um, for me, the, the paper, the pencil, it's still an extension of me and, and it just feels really organic and right. Um but for some reason, the inking, I'm able to kind of wrap my head around, yeah. even though it was my favorite part, dipping the brush and doing the smooth lines. Uh, I used to want to ink like Jeff Smith or Bill Watterson, kind of capture that. Like, I love those chunky, thick to thin lines and stuff like yeah. that. Um, so I've spent a lot of time trying to recreate that digitally. Um, and I think it was, a, I think it was Mike was saying, and it, like the, part of that is because of the paper, like a part of it is like the, so I, the Strathmore paper over the years, the quality has really gone down and yeah. um, it's made it really hard. And it was actually really affirming to hear him talk about it because there are sometimes where you think it's just you, you know, like, cause it's hard to compare notes on that kind of stuff. Cause everybody uses different tools. There's not a lot of people who are all using making comics exactly the same way. Sure. Um, and I remember Scott McLeod years ago saying that, like when you buy a brush, like one, like one out of every five brushes is a dud. Right. Um, and I was noticing that too with like crow quill pens where like I was hand lettering with crow quill pens and they would shatter all the time. Like they would just like break like really, really easily. Um, so that was like one of many reasons why I made the font off my handwriting so that I could not have little shards of copper flying into my eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that, that sounds like a good, you shouldn't need safety goggles to uh to let i did and then, especially because like i lean in when i'm making you know so it's like you know you're like going in with the pen and then it just ping, you know it's like yeah wow wow okay so that 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 would be the the next question was it, it's it's a font based on your handwriting yeah yeah, yeah. Um, john patrick green was the first dude i ever knew who figured out how to make fonts 
Uh, so for a while he was kind of like one of the go-to guys. Like, I mean, I, I mean, obviously uh, Richard Starkings and like, you know, the comic craft guys, they're the real ones, but uh, like in my circle of friends, John was the one who figured out how to make fonts and uh, was very generous and helped me make a font based on my handwriting. Nice. Well, not my, my comic handwriting, the way that I was yeah, yeah. In my comics. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it, it looks, um, it looks like it's, it's actually hand lettered. So that's, that's what you really want. Yeah. Except it's like too perfect. Right. Like that's yeah. the, the thing I had to get used to is like it. And there's some people who have figured out how to put in extra little letter, like alternating letters and things so that they raise and lower just a little bit. Yeah. Um, but at a certain point I had to just move on with my life and say, <laughs> are, are you, are you making your own balloons or, or yeah, is that... I hand draw the balloons. Yeah. yeah. And actually with book one, most of the balloons are still hand inked the balloons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then how about the color process? Color process. Uh, I'm very, very, very lucky that I got to team up with amazing colorists. Uh, so for unicorn boy, um, the most of the book was colored by Heather Mann, who is an SVA graduate, does amazing fantasy comics. She's a huge fan of like the Dark Crystal and all the kind of cool fantasy movies that I love. So she's the perfect person uh, to collaborate with. And uh, and it's yeah, it's just a really great process. Um, I would love to color the books myself, but that's the part where it would go from being like two years per book to like five years per book. I right, think. right, right, right. I can see that, um, and I, I thought it was because I, I, I noticed at the at the top of the uh, uh, the front of the book, there's like a special credit for someone coloring seven pages of the of the book. Yeah, um, those are an artist duo, Jess and Sin, um, mm -hmm. and they have a book. I think it's called Lunar Boy that's mm -hmm. coming out soon. Mm -hmm. um, they colored Astronaut Academy three. Okay. So right as soon as I finished Astronaut Academy three because I was already developing unicorn boy. Um, I had them do some test pages. So, yeah. and those test pages just were so beautiful that we were just like, let's just put them in the book. And yeah. there's it, you know, there was a little bit of a debate. I was like, should I have Heather recolor these pages <laughs> just for, you know, just for the, but I was like, eh, let's see what happens. You know, I yeah. I, I just don't know that I've ever, again, I, that I've ever seen pages one, yeah, three, yeah. eight, yeah. 20 yeah, like, no one's ever that? Just thinking about that before, like, you know. i keep doing that <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> because I, I actually hired someone for book two you'll love this uh so for book two there's a couple of scenes that like are really intense like the backgrounds are really intense uh so i hired my own jahard uh who's remember jahard who's doing the dave sims backgrounds yep uh so this amazing uh student uh caitlin i hired them to do to design this library sequence uh, that's like really kind of involved. Um, so they did like a pass and then I took their drawings and redrew their drawings yeah. <laughs> so that it would look in my style. Interesting. Um, so there's like, the, there's like Caitlin's version and then there's my version. Um, but yeah, extra, you know, just getting more, more and more steps. You should, you should include some of this stuff in like, some back matter. In, yeah, in actually, we were talking about that uh, for the second book. If I think if the way the signature might work, we might have a couple extra pages. This time we had like no extra pages. Um, I didn't even have like a thanks page or anything. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, if the signature works out, yeah, I would absolutely love to do that. Um, yeah. How about the decision to make the book the trim size that it is? Because it, it's it's a little smaller than than a traditional. Um, uh, first, second, or scholastic size kids book. Um, yes and no, because uh, there are some first, second. Like I so, am old enough to be like first, second used to have their house style, their yeah. house size. But somewhere along the line, I mean, like I think George O'Connor's Olympians was like the first time where they did like let's do a larger one, right? And then somewhere along the line, uh, they started doing some smaller ones. Uh, so now my books are one of the smaller ones and I don't know, like you tell me, like I, okay. I, like, this comes from I'm asking because I don't know, man. Like, I know. And I have no so say. This is not, it. this is not a, this is not your decision then. Yeah. No, even, uh, uh, like the UK one is like a little bit bigger. 
Yeah, uh, wild. And like they uh -huh. changed the logo a little bit, but it's like, yeah, the, uh -huh. you can't see it. I don't have a side by side to show you, but the, yeah, for some reason, that size, they said, no, this is the size. And I had no say in it. And that's why I said, like, it's always a little bit smaller than I think it's going to be. Because um, yeah. in my head, I always think it's going to be a little larger. Yeah. Well, it's it's certainly attractive book. And as I said, it it was it, it was a real joy to read this. Um it was it was just it was full of ideas and full of energy and I you you did a really good job. It was certainly worth the 2 years you put into it. Brian, Don't cry, Dave. No, Brian, seriously, thank you so much. I mean it, Okay, well, I mean I'm it, saying it really means a lot. Like I like I it, I know it's very easy to sound like I'm you know, just, oh, I'm being humiliated. No, I really mean that because that, it, I did work really hard. <laughs> um, and like you, like I said, like I just had no idea. I had no yeah. idea if it was going to connect yeah. or not. So the fact that, you know, people have different, you know, because again, like this is what's great about comics, right? Like that's like, to me, the best comics are the ones that like a grown adult, a kid, you know, that we can get something out of it and, and, and just have fun with it. And that's, yeah. you know, you know, like I'm, I'm making comics just to have fun. Like, and I'm making comics to entertain people. So when someone says, you know, that they just enjoy the ride of it, like that's, yeah. the, that's the best compliment in the world. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll even tell you, you know, I mean, I, I obviously I read a lot of graphic novels to, to pick the stuff for the club. Uh, but I was like, I don't know. I think I was like six pages in, and I'm like, this, this is the book. I mean, I'm gonna. Re I read the whole thing, but I, I knew, I knew that fast that like, oh yeah. Even, even if somehow he screws up an ending, this is still gonna be a great ride all the way there. And you didn't screw up the ending, so, so yay, <laughs> yay to you, Dave Roman. Oh my good, god, good job, my friend. Good, good job. Ride. Um, all right, let's well, I'm, I'm proof positive that you know sometimes you just gotta keep doing it. You gotta yeah. just keep making books and at some point, you know, they hit they, yeah. they connect. Un unbelievably we're almost at an hour and a half here. Oh. And and people keep walking up to the door of the store and going, What why aren't they letting us in? The store's supposed oh. to be open. <laughs> so so let's, the store's closed. No, I know. I it, we're supposed to we're supposed to open at eleven, but it, it's all mm -hmm. it's all good. If I'm having a conversation, it's yeah. all good. Um so let's let's go to the let's go to the wrap up questions. Uh, so there's always two. Um, the first one is: Is there anything else you'd like to plug? Um, obviously, it takes you two years to do one of these. So Unicorn Boy Two is probably not coming out anytime immediately soon. Is there anything else in? Not as, in good as they would have liked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would recommend uh, uh, checking out. There's a comics newsletter called Sunday Haha ha, that okay. was started by uh, a couple of cartoonists, one of whom's in the Bay Area. Um, and uh, it's like meant to be like a subscription to your email where we're like kids comic strips, almost like, you know, sun that's why it's Sunday Haha. Ha, it's like the old Sunday funnies. Yeah. Um, and every now and then I do a comic called Pup and Duck for that. Um, but even the weeks that I'm not there, uh, there's another amazing, other amazing cartoonists to check out. Um, and it just comes into your email. Nice. That's very cool. Okay, well, look at that. Pop up. Wait, what'd you Sunday say? Ha -ha. Sunday haha. -ha. I, I seriously. Sunday ha -ha -ha. No, that's the name of the strip, not the name yeah. of Sunday haha. -ha. Okay. Sunday haha -ha com. Look, look it up, kids. Uh, cool. And then, and then the last question, and you know, this this may either be the easiest question or the hardest question because you actually teach, but. As as you know, this is a long series of interviews. We're we're about to start our tenth year in July, by the way, of this, which blows me away. Which means we're at like almost two hundred and forty interview. Well, actually, we're past two hundred and forty interviews at this point. Um, and and so a lot of people watch this who want to make their own comics. Um, and what I hear from a good number of people is. I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know how to start. I don't know how to turn this idea into an actual thing, et cetera, et cetera. So what's, what's the piece of advice that you would give to someone who's at that stage, who, who, who is not yet ready to spend a bunch of money to go to school to, to get a, a degree uh, to, so that they, they can feel the confidence to make comics. This can be something 
physical and practical. It could be something emotional. It could be something spiritual. What, what, what would be your piece of advice, though, Dave Roman? It's too late. <laughs> what are you waiting for? <laughs> get, get going. Um, no, I, you know, I think that honestly, you know, there's no reason not to make comics. They really, you know, the, the, as so many people have already pointed out, the barrier to entry is, is, is minimal at best, uh, at least to make it, I mean, to make it good is a whole other story and make something that connects with people. Like it could take your whole life to do that. But as far as just making comics, like you should be making them already. Like there's no reason not to start making them now. Um, get those bad comics out of the way or, you know, and, and, you know, learn on the job because that's the best way to do anything. You know, just jump in the ocean, start swimming, figure it out. Um, but then long-term, the advice, like when I, so like for now people who are in school or, you know, trying to do this on some sort of serious basis, um, I think all we can ever do is try to find either, you know, the stories that only we can tell or the stories told in a way that only we could tell them, you know, so like there's nothing in Unicorn Boy that's an original idea, but how I tell it is me, you know, like yeah. I can rest easy knowing that if somebody else came out with a comic about a kid with a unicorn horn, it's not going to read like my book sure. because I've made it, you know, and this took time to figure out like, what's my voice? What are the ways that I tell stories? What are my instincts? What are, you know, what are the things that excite me? What are the things that make me laugh? Um, so a lot of it is finding your voice and then just leaning into it as much as you can. And if you're making stuff that's really personal, and making stuff that you're having fun with, generally other people dig that stuff, right? Like that's the like, you know, the classic thing. If you see somebody having fun, you're gonna be like, hey, what's happening over there? <laughs> yeah. yeah, dig it. I, I love that answer. I think that's exactly perfect. Um, well, cool. Thank you for for taking the time to uh, speak. This is this has been a breeze of a conversation. As I said, we're at an hour and a half. Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like we could go another hour and a half without even trying hard. You know. Um, but, but we got to, it's got to keep moving. It's got to keep moving. No, well, thank you, Brian. And thank you, you know, for even one, for having a store that is great and getting, you know, people into books and comics for all yeah. these years. Um, and then putting a spotlight on all these cartoonists. It's an honor to be a part of it. It's, I mean, it's, it's literally what I, I, I love doing. So it's not even hard work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of <laughs> easy. Uh, cool. Well, you, you hold on for one second. They're going to put me on a one. I'm going to do a little house cleaning here and uh, housekeeping here. And uh, we'll be back. Um, hey, so you at home, you, you there, sitting there, um, you want something fun to read. You want something good to read. You want something uh, that's gonna gonna fill your your brain with lots and lots of ideas, and you're gonna have a lot of fun and laughs while you read it. This is your book, man, Unicorn Boy. Uh, if you, if there's a thing you can click. Uh, uh, there's the, at the bottom of the screen too, but there is a, there should be a button um, if you're not watching this live that you can go and just order one from our web store. You should do that because that's how we we keep things going. Um, we really appreciate you thinking about that, but it's a great book and it's really 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 worth your time. I'm not just saying that because I, I can make Dave cry by saying that. Um, uh, all right, uh, some thank yous. Uh, I want to thank Jordan uh, uh, Willux, our producer, for doing backstage stuff. Um, nobody sees it except me. Well, and the cartoonist too. But uh, but we couldn't have a show without all the stuff that he does. I want to thank Ben for running the show, doing our camera work, etc. Thank you, Ben. Um, I want to thank my staff, Zoe, Kat, Katie, and Max, for for being the best staff that a comic shop can have, which allows me to have these conversations with people. Um, I want to thank all of you who are watching these shows, you know, click and like and do all that thing, you know, tell your friends, yada, yada. But I, I really appreciate, I really appreciate you. I especially appreciate all the members of the Graphic Novel Club. Every single month, you get a cool new book like this. There's a kids club. There's also an adults club. Um, I, I, I thank you all. And I just thank you so much. Uh, and then I also, well, I need to thank the cartoonists as well. Guys like Dave right here. Hi, Dave. Um, for, for making it. Because if it wasn't for you making these these books, then then we we uh, I wouldn't have a show and I wouldn't have a store. So thank you all. Uh, super fast. Um, in two weeks is our adult club. We're doing Tender um, by Beth Hetland. 
Um, this is a very, very uh, kids don't read this comic. This is not a comic for you. Um, there's a lot of blood and gore in this, but it's it's a really it's a really really good smart book. Uh, and then next month's kids club, we are doing um, Magic Girls, Kira, and the maybe Space Princess, um, uh, which is by uh, Megan Brennan. Um, and this was a very fun, great book, and you're going to like this, and that's who we're talking to next month. So watch for both of those shows. Other than that, let's put Dave back on, and I will say one more thank you. Oh, he's he has, see, he can even, that, <laughs> that's the first time that's ever happened. Good job, Dave Roman. Good job. Yeah. Megan is awesome. If you like Unicorn Boy, you'll definitely love Magic Girls. Yep. That's exactly right. Cool. Well, thank you, Dave. Thank you, everyone at home. We'll see you next month or next week, next show. Thank you for watching this episode of the Graphic Novel of the Month Club. If you enjoyed what you were watching, please uh, subscribe and hit that bell up in the top corner. If you enjoyed the books that we're talking about and the creators that we're talking to, every month we pick a brand new book. Uh, the staff votes on it. It's a program that helps keep our store alive, and we'd love to have you as a member. You'll get a new book every month. Just follow that URL at the bottom of the screen. Turning off. There it goes.